Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, for those who are joining us in Washington, uh, joining on the other side of the Atlantic and those that are joining in Tbilisi uh, on behalf of the German Marshall Fund in the United States, um, I wanna welcome you. Uh, this is a, an event that's co-hosted with our colleagues at GMF's Bucharest office, the Black Sea Trust, uh, and my colleague, Alina Anai, who unfortunately couldn't join us uh, today. We wanna welcome you. Uh, our conversation today is gonna be focused on an, a report launch um, on Georgia. And I think uh, an incredibly timely report given uh, what's taking place on the ground in Georgia and also uh, what's taking place both in, in the US and in Europe as well. My name is Jonathan Katz, I'm a senior fellow uh, and also a director of democracy initiatives at the German Marshall Fund. And I'm gonna be moderating today's discussion uh, with uh, Ambassador Ian Kelly and David Kramer uh, and as I mentioned, unfortunately, Alina and I couldn't, uh, is unable to join us for today's conversation. And we're going to discuss, you know, what I mentioned as an incredibly timely report. Uh, and I know that the authors of this didn't plan it in this way, but it so happened that it did coincide with uh, the challenges that we're seeing today. And this is uh, the, the report is titled The Country on the Verge, the Case for Supporting Georgia. Um, and as I mentioned, Ambassador Ian Kelly and David Kramer are the lead authors uh, with several others weighing in uh, in this process. David and Ian, I just want to congratulate you on this report. Um, incredibly detailed, informative. Uh, there's a link uh, in the uh, invitation that everybody uh, received and signed up for. So please make sure you take, if you haven't read it yet or read through it completely, please do so. Um, but it's also, it's a telling report um, and a must read really for those who are in Washington or in Europe or in Tbilisi who are looking at, at Georgia today and looking at Georgia's Euro-Atlantic integration, um, looking at Georgia's democracy, but, but also about uh, support and how the US uh, and other partners should be engaging Georgia um, and looking at it through multiple lenses, economic, security, political. Uh, and uh, I think we're at a moment, you know, I think in Georgia, it seems like there's always these junctures. This is one of those junctures, these key moments and so we're really pleased to have uh, David and Ian uh, here to do this. Um, and as I said, this couldn't be a more important time. Uh, you know, post-election in Georgia, uh, there's been what we many view, including from Washington, as a real political crisis, um, one that needs attention. We know the EU is deeply involved in this. Uh, U.S. Ambassador uh, Degnan as well, uh, including Christian Danielson, um, who is coming back to uh, to Georgia again to help mediate uh, challenges between political parties. Um, and, and this is a pivotal moment because uh, Georgia's future hangs in the balance. And in this case, this report, which talks about a country on the verge um, and the case for supporting Georgia, highlights a point that these two authors who have been long engaged in Georgia for decades from various positions um, are really looking at ways to, uh, to support that engagement, strengthen relations between the United States and, and Georgia as many have done, and to find a path forward. And all, both of them know quite well to the threats, the security threats uh, from the North, from Russia, but also the, the challenges in the South Caucasus as well. So a lot to talk, a lot to get to in this. Um, and I just wanted to you know, thank them again. And I wanted to just quickly, if I can, do just a quick bio, and then we'll go to, we'll start off with David um, with a quick question. And I apologize for the length of my intro because we really want to get to them. We want to get to the authors of this report. So uh, first, uh, uh, David Kramer. David is a senior fellow at Florida International University's Stephen J. Green School of International and Public Affairs. Uh, he's worked in senior leadership positions uh, at the McCain Institute. Um, he was a senior, uh, you know, as the senior director for human rights and democracy, leadership roles, uh, leading Freedom House and also at GMF. And so we're, we're proud to also uh, bring, uh, call David one of the family at GMF. Um, he also served in eight years in the US Department of uh, State, including as Assistant Secretary of Department of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor, DRL. Um, he was the Deputy Assistant Secretary for European and Eurasian Affairs uh, and has held other, other, other senior positions as well. David, uh, thank you for joining us today. Great to see you. And Ambassador Ian Kelly, he is uh, Ambassador in Residence, International Studies and Slavic Languages and Literature at Northwestern University. Uh, he is also a retired senior foreign service officer who last served as the U.S. Ambassador to Georgia 
from 2015 to 2018. Uh, previously served as a U.S. ambassador to the OSCE uh, from 2010 to 2013, and has held a variety of high-level positions at the U.S. State Department and, and served as Secretary Clinton's spokesperson from 2009 to 2010. I won't go through the full uh, Ian's full bio beyond that, but um, is somebody who's steeped in working in this region, including uh, in Russia as well. Uh, so understands the issues from inside and outside. Uh, Ambassador Kelly, it's great to see you in. And I, I think what we're going to do is we're going to just kick it off. And, and one of the things that I uh, pose, you know, this is for both of you to answer if you want to, but but really maybe just give us a little bit uh, a better understanding of the report. Um, and sort of the key takeaways for those that are interested. And I said, this is a must read for those that are focused on Georgia and Washington, Europe, and in Tbilisi. And so David, if I could just turn it over to you and uh, to kick us off uh, for this conversation. Jonathan, thanks very much, Jonathan, for the introduction and huge thanks to you, Alina, uh, John and Alexander, who's helped us with this as well. And Nick Boucher uh, for his great editing job. And I also want to offer a huge shout out to Nino Evgenidze and the Economic Policy Research Center, who has been a, a great support in this and will translate the report into Georgian for any of our viewers who are tuning in from, from Georgia. Um, so a uh, huge thanks. And, and, and I reached out to Ian last summer um, and thinking about Georgia, particularly with a transition here in the United States and thought it would be a useful time to look at the US-Georgian relationship and what the United States might do, whether President Trump had been reelected um, or now with a new Biden administration and the timing I think has worked out very well. I also would add our timing today is, is quite fortuitous in the sense that there is a hearing this afternoon in a subcommittee of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee on Georgia with two State Department officials testifying. So uh, it's great to see that there is attention being focused on Georgia, uh, though some of it is out of concern with the recent developments. Let me, let me just highlight a few things from the report, if I can, um, and, and start with why, why this matters. Why, why a report on Georgia of all places? And um, it has long been seen as this island of democracy in a sea of authoritarianism. And um, Georgia now, as you mentioned with the title of the report, stands on the verge of going either way, um, either remaining that island of democracy or tipping into the sea. And, and we certainly obviously hope that it will remain this island of democracy in what has become an increasingly unstable region, particularly after the renewed fighting between Armenia and Azerbaijan last fall. The United States, I think without question, and with all due respect to our European friends and allies, has more influence uh, in and on Georgia than any other country. And we argue in this report that the U.S. needs to step up its involvement and role uh, in, in, in Georgia, supporting Georgia, including in trying to help facilitate a resolution to the current crisis. And I think it is a crisis, and I think Ian will get into that in a, in a few minutes. We have, the U.S. has provided some $4 billion in military and non-military aid to Georgia over the past several decades to support Georgia's democratic transition and Euro Atlantic aspirations, and also to help it defend itself against further Russian aggression. Let's never forget that since 2008, Russian forces have been occupying 20% of Georgia's territory. So what happened in Georgia then, now what, 13 years ago almost, was a precursor to what we saw unfold in Ukraine in 2014. In 2008, we didn't do very much about that invasion. Um, and I think uh, many have paid a price ever since. Georgia serves as a, as a Western gateway um, for trade from Central Asia and is the only economically viable east-west route that does not transit Russia or Iran. Um, for pipelines, railways, uh, highways for goods and resources, and routes to the Black Sea and, and beyond. So economically, commercially, um, Georgia is a key player, uh, including in the Black Sea region, where it has the potential to really pick up its role and contributions to security and development. Georgian troops um, have partnered with the US military uh, and NATO forces in Iraq, Afghanistan, and elsewhere 
demonstrating Georgia's true commitment to being a net contributor to international security, uh, and this before even being welcomed into the NATO alliance, which it uh, very much wants to become uh, a member of um, since uh, really the, the late 2000s. And Georgia has answered nearly every call from both NATO and the EU, despite not being a member of either one, to serve in peacekeeping or combat missions. Um, and, and there have been too many Georgians who have paid the ultimate price uh, for its country's contributions and supporting stability and security around the world. The current crisis, and Ian will get into this more, um, comes at a rather unfortunate time for Georgia, where Georgia needs to be uh, excelling and showing what a great model it can be in the region, um, but it also is, is critical for Georgia's own development, given the other challenges that Georgia faces. And let me just touch on those. Uh, the parliamentary elections last fall uh, have led to a situation now where essentially Georgia is a one-party uh, parliament. And, and that puts it in the rather undistinguished company of countries like China and North Korea, Cuba and elsewhere. That, that's a situation that obviously needs to change. And there have been different assessments about the parliamentary elections last fall. Um, the, the Georgian dream, the party in power, um, cites the positives in the assessments that have come out. The opposition cites the criticisms that have been voiced by various domestic and international observers. Suffice it to say, the situation has reached a point where the opposition to this day, at least, has refused to take its seats in the parliament. And this boycott has led to this one party uh, situation that is not healthy for Georgia at all. Um, the, the arrest of Nick Amelia um, has, has made matters even more tense and turned a stalemate, I would argue, into a crisis. The COVID-19 pandemic has obviously devastated every country around the world, um, and Georgia has been no exception after handling it quite well uh, in the first wave last spring. But the second wave, and perhaps an ongoing wave or a third wave, have really taken a toll. And I looked up the latest numbers this morning. Georgia uh, has uh, 278,000 cases. Um, reported 3,710 deaths so far, a pretty high number for a country of Georgia's size. So the toll has taken, a, uh, the, the pandemic rather, has taken a significant toll in public health terms. It's also taken quite a toll economically as well, given the, the lockdowns that have been imposed and the restrictions on travel uh, that we have seen too. Um, that, that is a problem not unique to Georgia, but it underscores that Georgia, on top of dealing with the pandemic, cannot afford a political crisis as it's in right now. There's also the Armenia-Azerbaijan conflict, which I won't get into very much, um, but suffice it to say that that has contributed to instability in the region and has also resulted in the deployment of nearly 2,000 Russian troops uh, in the Nagorno-Karabakh area, which means that Russian troops are now stationed in all three countries in the South Caucasus. Um, two by invitation with Armenia uh, hosting a Russian military base, now in Nagorno-Karabakh with Azerbaijan, and Georgia, of course, um, wholly uninvited, the Georgian government and, and the Georgian people asked Russian forces to depart and they refuse. So, so where does that leave us? Um, the, the United States, as I said, does have outsized influence in Georgia, um, and I think needs to exercise that uh, more vigorously. Um, the Biden administration obviously has its hands full with many crises domestically and in foreign policy. We've seen heightened tensions between uh, Washington and Moscow, Washington and Beijing. Um, but uh, with a new team coming on board, I hope sooner rather than later, at the State Department, we, we will, I hope, see more engagement um, from the U.S. side. And, and I do want to give credit to the people uh, who are already there, career people like George Kent, who, who does a, a great job um, with a number of challenging countries in his portfolio. We identified seven specific recommendations, and I'll just uh, highlight them in the interest of time here. Um, first and foremost, to show more interest in Georgia's success including by reinvigorating the U.S.-Georgian Strategic Partnership Commission, the United States needs to play a, a more prominent and visible role on the ground in Georgia uh, in addition to the embassy. We, we, of course, had a gap between ambassadors after Ian left uh, and, and a new ambassador was, was finally put in place because of some 
problems on the Georgian end, not the U.S. end, to be clear. Uh, but, but we need to put more skin in the game, if you will. Second, we need to encourage Georgia to stay on the democratic Western-oriented path, uh, and the latest crisis underscores the need for this recommendation. Uh, third, keep the door open for Georgia to join NATO and the EU. Um, NATO member states, let's remember, in Bucharest in 2008, declared the following, NATO welcomes Ukraine's and Georgia's Euro-Atlantic aspirations for membership. We agree today that these countries will become members of NATO. Well, here we are in 2021, and there has not been anywhere near enough progress toward achieving this goal. Um, fourth recommendation, help Georgia build better checks and balances with strong democratic institutions, such as civil society organizations and independent media, which play an absolutely indispensable role um, in Georgia and, and, and elsewhere for that matter. Fifth, one that may seem a stretch for many people, but, but we think it's important to list, and that is to try to fast track a free trade agreement um, to the extent possible, recognizing there's quite a long line of countries looking for an FTA with the United States. Six, continue to help Georgia defend itself. And here I think um, the, the previous administration and, and, and I believe the current administration will continue to do a, a, a good job on this. Uh, and then that leads to the seventh uh, related recommendation to help push back on Russian threats to Georgia. Um, but uh, if the current political crisis is not solved, and this may be a good segue, Jonathan, for you and Ian, um, a lot of these recommendations are going to become much more difficult to achieve. So let me stop there. Thanks. David, thank you for that. And thank you for running through those recommendations. And I think you highlight Couple of things. One, there's heightened, there is heightened concern in Washington about what's taking place. And I think the Senate hearing today that you pointed out um, uh, really speaks to that. But it also, I think, speaks to the interest in, 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 in Washington and seeing Georgia succeed democratically and sort of follow through on the, all those lists that you, you'll find strong support for Euro Atlantic integration, NATO, um, and also recognition of, of what you mentioned too is the sacrifice of Georgians. Um, who have stepped up um, on security issues to work with the United States, with NATO. And I think that that can't be forgotten in this. But you also highlight there are some deep challenges on the ground, including COVID, which is not only wrecked havoc in Georgia, but also globally. And it's it's something that that needs to be dealt with. Ian, if I could uh, just bring you in now to you, uh, we're ambassador uh, from 2015 to 2018. Uh, maybe you can just pick up on from where David left off in terms of of these recommendations. Um, I think you know fully well um, what the, some of these security challenges that were raised, but also just on the issues of democracy, uh, governance, judicial reform. Uh, uh, David mentioned that the, there's a new administration highly focused on, on a democracy agenda, combating corruption. We've already seen signals of them going after uh, certain actors, including in Ukraine, like Mr. Kolomoisky. I mean, just a, a, a new, I think really a renewed effort to support uh, democratic transition. And, but I also wanted, so I wanted to ask you, you sort of both about, about the recommendations, what you see as being important, but also from your previous role, how do you, how does Georgia get back um, on track? And, and uh, this isn't the first political crisis uh, in Georgia, you get you point you both point this out in this report. There's been other challenges. How, what does the road ahead look like? And and feel free to respond in any which way you want to to David David's opening. But I think these are some really relevant questions because it is true the U.S. has a, a tremendous um, has influence because it's worked so closely not only with Georgian government officials but also with civil society, with Georgian uh, business and others uh, in support. And it's really worked across Georgia, not just singling any one group out, but really trying to lift Georgia up wholesale. So maybe I could turn to you to pick up where uh, David left off. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Thanks to the, uh, to the German Marshall Fund as well. Uh, and David, I thought you did a great uh, summary of, uh, of our recommendations. We did indeed see an opportunity um, coming this fall or last fall with the two elections within, a, within about a week of each other. So we were looking at a juncture, really, uh, a transition, 
in many ways to, to new uh, figures, new political figures on uh, uh, both in Washington and in Tbilisi. And I think our overriding goal here was to make sure that Georgia did not get lost in those, uh, in those transitions, particularly the transition um, uh, in Washington. So, you know, our main goal was to highlight <clears throat> just how important uh, Georgia is to, uh, to United States uh, interests. Of course, uh, uh, we all know that Georgia is an important partner uh, for the U.S. military. Uh, in my three years in, in Tbilisi, I really thought there were uh, no closer, no uh, sort of fraternal relationships uh, between Americans and Georgians than there were between <clears throat> Georgian soldiers and U.S. Marines and U.S. soldiers. So that's, that's very important how Georgia has been willing to put its... Um, uh, its sons and daughters on the line to serve side by side, not only with the U.S., but uh, with uh, with all the countries in NATO and uh, with the EU in peacekeeping operations in Africa. As uh, David pointed out, it was uh, really important for us to continue to support uh, the territorial integrity of, of Georgia, and even more importantly, continue to support its aspirations uh, to join the EU uh, to show that uh, Russia uh, and other uh, non-NATO states have no say, no veto on the sovereign decisions of, uh, of democratic states. I think it was also uh, important, and this is again something that uh, David uh, touched on, it was also important to highlight that it's important for the United States that the whole idea of um, democratic governance, whole idea of a uh, of liberal governance, of a liberal approach to trade and interstate relations, that it would succeed in what has become really uh, an illiberal zone. And I, what I mean by that is the the former Soviet Union uh, minus the uh, minus the Baltic states. And then, of course, there's the whole idea of Georgia being a real critical part of this Southern corridor uh, that enables the economies of Central Asia to get their goods and their resources uh, to market without having Russia um, having a, you know, a, a hand on the, uh, on the spigot. Uh, and I think that would have a, a real kind of a, a, a virtuous effect if Georgia really succeed, then there's a counter model to the, the Russian model of uh, top-down governance of uh, what the Russians call a vertical of power. Um, and finally, I'll just, uh, I'll just wrap up by saying that uh, it's no exaggeration to call what Georgia is going through right now a crisis. Uh, Georgia has seen before the uh, gradual accumulation of power uh, in, in one per person uh, and uh, in, in one party. Uh, we saw it with Kamsa uh, Hurdia, Shevard Nadze, Saakashvili. The more I did research on the, the history of Georgian democracy, the more I saw that tendency. Um, but I think this is different and, and it has a, uh, a much more uh, Pernish, a possible pernicious outcome uh, if the, the political parties in Georgia are unable to resolve this situation and enable the uh, opposition to take seats in parliament, uh, we are looking at um, a very non-Western style of, of government. We're looking, at a, we're looking at a regime. And as things stand now, and this, this has been the problem, really, I, I think, uh, throughout Georgian democracy, the, the problem of lacks, lack of checks and balances on the executive. And the most important aspect of having that kind of check and balance is a, uh, a, a pluralistic parliament. You can't just have one party. Um, so, I mean, these are sort of the, the essential 
essential problems that are creating this crisis. And um, it is really something, and, I mean, in the near term, we need to get the opposition seated and have a democratic, uh, have, have opposition voices in, in parliament. But in the longer term, um, Georgians really have to address in a very serious way uh, the, the problem of, uh, of judicial uh, independence. There is far too much political use of the judiciary for commercial decisions, but unfortunately also for political and uh, law enforcement decisions. So I'll, I'll stop there and I look forward to hearing questions. Great. Um, I wanted to just on that, Ian, is just to remind everybody that there's a Q&A function on, on Zoom and you know, please feel free to, to post some questions. I see some coming in, um, and but I did, one thing I wanted to start with, you know, to ask you is about um, about how this current situation, uh, if resolved, impacts Georgia's Euro-Atlantic integration process. Uh, I know Georgia Dream has a, a goal of, of uh, at least I think starting EU membership talks by 2024. There's, you know, they want to move the NATO process forward. I think everybody would like to see that that be uh, just to see some progress in that area. But I thought maybe asking both of you about about the impact. Uh, you started to speak a little bit about, you know, the the prospect if 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 things can't get unstuck. Um, but, you know, not only I mean, there's a domestic political ramifications, but there's also external as well, and what signals it sends uh, to to partners like the United States and and the EU. So maybe if you could answer that question, if both of you, I don't know who wants to answer that that first. David, do you want to jump in? And then sure. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, uh, Prime Minister Garibashvili was just in Brussels last week, met with EU leaders, met with NATO leaders, um, seemed to have good meetings. But but let's be honest, um, this crisis is terrible for, for Georgia's prospects for your Atlantic integration. Um, the, Georgia has stood out in part. It's a beautiful country, wonderful people, great food and wine but also because it has, for the most part, been a pretty strong democracy. And Georgia risks veering from that democratic path if this crisis doesn't get resolved soon. Ian is absolutely right to talk about the, the medium and longer term objectives. Um, there, there is an immediate uh, 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 issue that needs to be resolved. And I, I think in order for the opposition and Georgian dream to sit down and hammer out a compromise, um, the Georgian authorities need to release Nika Amelia, the leader of the UNM party, the United National Movement. It's the leading opposition party. Neither Ian nor I carries any water for UNM or any other opposition party, nor do we carry water for Georgian Dream. Uh, but, but I think it's, <clears throat> excuse me, I think it's, it's just logical that you can't have the leaders of the various parties sit down and negotiate as long as one of them is sitting in jail. Um, so there needs to be an immediate resolution to that part of the crisis. And then it will be up to the Georgian parties to sort out the compromise. I, I, Ian is right um, that I think uh, the Georgian opposition after that should return to the parliament, but then the Georgian dream should find some way of granting some uh, influence and in, in positions of, of power in the parliament to the opposition so that it is uh, not just a, a, a fig leaf a kind of representation for the opposition. Um, this is a crisis that, if not resolved, is going to set Georgia back. And the United States will look at Georgia and say, we have enough other problems to deal with with countries that can get past these political crises. We'll focus on them and not on Georgia. And that would be terrible for everyone. Ian, do you want to respond to yeah, I mean, just uh, I, I think one thing that I would really like to hear out of uh, the uh, Brussels, the EU headquarters and NATO headquarters, is just a, a simple exhortation or just a simple statement of fact that a one party parliament is incompatible with joining uh, either either organization. I think that we need to have a much more clear, uh, clear statement on that. And um I think that you don't need to talk about sanctions now. Uh, if you talk about the, the, the present status quo as 
preventing Georgia from attaining its number one foreign policy priority, that I think should be incentive enough uh, for both sides to, uh, to compromise. Uh, I think NATO actually has been a little more clear on that, but I would like to hear the, the EU simply say, this is unacceptable. Uh, this is the present situation uh, will not lead you to your, um, your number one foreign policy aspiration. And I hear that this afternoon, by the way, from senators and, and, and from the State Department representatives at the hearing and the Foreign Relations Committee too. I, I hope there are clear signals sent on a bipartisan basis um, that w the current situation is in fact unacceptable and doing harm to Georgia's aspirations. I agree with you. Yeah, and, and I think in, in all of this, too, you still see strong support from the Georgian public to, to move in a certain direction. So it's, uh, it's really about, in some sense, you know, really fulfilling what the Georgian public wants to do. And, you know, I know um, one of the questions we had, and I, I wanted to raise this, too, because I think um, uh, they've, been, they've been sort of in the crosshairs of, um, is a question about what do you think about the role of, of civil society um, and, you know, and election watch, watchdogs in this current crisis. Um, and um, I mentioned earlier that, you know, and I, I think important that, you know, that, that, that all parts of Georgian society are needed for democracy to succeed. But maybe, you know, Ian and Dave, you both have worked with Georgian civil society and or engaged directly with them. Um, and, and, and Ian, I think you've even in the past have, have stepped up when uh, there's been some challenges as well, because this is um, Georgian politics is, is, uh, can be rough and tumble. Um, there's a difference of opinion, but maybe you could just speak to the role of civil society. And we have, I think it, we have no less than 17 questions in the queue, and we'll try to get to all of those. So uh, maybe just speak to that, because I think it's, uh, it's, it's important uh, to talk about the role of civil society. I don't know who wants to take that on. Ian? Yeah, I, I, the civil society is the absolute um, beating heart of Georgian democracy. Uh, it, it is, I think it does provide, I think um, the, the greatest uh, or the most vibrant check and balance against the power of the executive holding government uh, to account. Um, in my time, you know, I was seeing an erosion of other uh, traditional checks and balances like, uh, like the, the, the presidency, um, the uh, independent uh, media, especially independent uh, television. And, um, you know, I'm not in Tbilisi anymore, obviously, so I, I don't have the kind of on the ground uh, feel that I had, obviously. But it seems to me that, that civil society is, is the most important check against the power of the executive. I think one of its, uh, one of its vulnerable spots is the uh, Georgian economy has not grown to the extent where uh, civil society can exist on domestic sources alone. Uh, it relies quite a bit on EU and, and US funding and that I think leaves it open to um, some criticism of, uh, of partisanship. And I think that's one reason why David and I talked about the importance of uh, encouraging a free trade agreement, more foreign investment, um, more trade. Uh, and that's all in the, um, you know, under the, the, the rubric of building a real resilient state. Uh, you really need a growing economy to have a resilient state and be, have a real uh, vibrant uh, civil society sector. Can I? I, I would just add you know, two, two things. One is um, Ian and I felt a, a need to include an author's note in this report um, that acknowledges the problems here in the United States um, and increases, I think, the dose of humility that we need to bring, not just in assessing Georgia, but frankly, any country around the world, um, given, given some of the, the major problems we've gone through here in the United States of late. Um, I, I think that's important to acknowledge. That said, um, Ian and I come at this as huge admirers and friends of Georgia. Uh, we have many, many, many friends in the country. Um, Ian lived there. I've traveled there many times. 
civil society is indispensable, as it is in most countries. But in Georgia in particular, I think it plays a critical role. Um, and so, so do the media, um, whether they're independent or with one side or the other. And, and the reason I mentioned the author's note and the acknowledgments about problems in our own country, the situation is not helped when politicians of either the opposition or the power start attacking civil society and the media. Nor is it helped, Ian referenced about the use of the judicial system for political purposes, when a uh, Tbilisi court gives a, an order to go after a station like Perbelli over the, the uh, controversy of this recording. Um, and, and so there needs to be a better job of recognizing that the, the role of the media and civil society may not always work and serve one's political purpose, but they're serving the country's greater goals and objectives and they need to be left alone. They can be criticized. I mean, no one's immune from criticism, but being attacked the way they have been in some cases um, is, is really unhelpful and damaging to the country. Uh, there's, um, we're up now up to 26 questions, but we're gonna, we're gonna try to work our way Quite through. Quite a few it. of them are from one person, I see, which yeah. is great. I'm glad he's uh, engaged, so. Uh, so uh, what, you know, a couple of themes that run through this a couple of questions. One is um, this idea that the EU obviously is, is putting forward a, a strong effort to uh, mediate and, and resolve, uh, you know, the current impasse. Uh, as was mentioned, uh, David, you mentioned that the U.S. has outsized um, influence in Georgia. Uh, there's obviously deep concern in Washington about what's happening. Uh, several of those questions were asking in here asking whether or not the United States um, Ambassador Deckman is obviously deeply involved, but should not shouldn't this be raised to to a higher level within the U.S. government? Um, rather than the U.S. playing sort of what, what some people are describing as more of a backseat role to the leadership role in this, uh, wouldn't we want to see this? And I'll, I'll add my own to this. Uh, in this region, the South Caucasus, we saw um, in, 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 in the NK conflict, um, the U.S. not in, uh, in a real lead role. Um, and uh, maybe speak to the, uh, what you think the role of the U.S. should be. Is it the moment right now to, uh, to uh, have a higher level, more visible effort with Georgia, understanding that there's a number of other crises and challenges globally. Um, and, uh, you know, is there a lesson to be learned about what, what took place in the fall, which as you rightfully said, um, has led to the point where you now have Russian troops in uh, now both in Armenia and Azerbaijan and, and the landscape has changed. So maybe it's time for the U.S. to be more involved in a more leadership role. So that's one question. The other one is, is about Russia. As several people asked about the role of Russia uh, in the current political impasse and situation. Is, there, is Russia playing a role? Um, and I think there's some things that are happening that Russia is doing as this is happening, but maybe you could also ask about the Russian role, but what, you know, how does it, how, how does what's happening in Georgia impact uh, Russia, its interests, its calculation. So a question about the U.S. role and then also about Russia. So I don't know who wants to. Uh, well, one of, maybe I'll start with the U.S. role. You can jump in on Russia if you want. Um, um, th there's an unfortunate reality, um, which is uh, I don't believe Wendy Sherman has yet been confirmed by the Senate, but there's only one person in the State Department that's been confirmed by the Senate, and that's the Secretary of State. Um, which means that um, the State Department is really short on people uh, who can approach these issues with real authority. Again, I mentioned George Kent before. He's right now the highest level person, and he, he, he's a great guy, um, but he has some other countries that are occupying his time too. And so uh, this is where I think Georgia has the benefit of having a lot of interest on Capitol Hill. Um, there, there are some countries that do. Um, Georgia really stands out. There, there is a lot of bipartisan support for Georgia um, in both the House and the Senate. And, and this is where I think in the interim, perhaps, um, in the absence of more people on board at the State Department, 
uh, members of Congress could play a role, either through statements, through the hearing this afternoon, um, and when time permits, travel to, to Tbilisi. Um, I, I think it is critically important that the United States show interest as well as concern about what's happening there. And if the administration doesn't quite have its ducks lined up, um, Congress can, can step in. The pandemic obviously poses a huge challenge. I mean, I, I appreciate that uh, uh, both Michelle and Danielson have been able to travel, um, but uh, traveling in the middle of a pandemic poses um, unique challenges. So uh, we, we, we do need to increase our profile, however, because uh, the, the Europeans are, are giving it their best shot and I really salute them for what they're trying. Uh, Danielson is going back, as you said, Jonathan, but um, I, I really think the United States is going to have to pick up its game and, and play a more prominent role here. Ian? Yeah, on the, uh, on the issue of, uh, of Russia, uh, the, the events in, in uh, the South Caucasus and Nagorno-Karabakh and around uh, the region were uh, disturbing, obviously, for the, the, the violence and the human cost of, um, of the, uh, the, the start of a new war. Uh, but I think, you know, for me, uh, it was really also very disturbing to see how the United States and, uh, and France, who were the other two co-chairs who were uh, leaders agreed would take the lead in negotiating, were uh, elbowed out of, out of the, the whole equation, were just marginalized. Uh, also, one of the one of the agreements was to have uh, a, an international peacekeeping force to uh, enforce the ceasefire, and this is a Russian only uh, boots on the ground. Uh, so now you have uh, Russian troops in all three Caucasus countries, and um, this is, just sends a very uh, clear signal to everybody in the South Caucasus that if you have concerns about your territorial integrity. You have concerns uh, about the stability of your country. There's only one arbiter for that, and that is, and that's Russia. And that's a, a very damaging signal for the uh, two thirds and more Georgians who really have a European vocation. They want to, they want to turn west. They don't want to turn north. Uh, so uh, that was very, very concerning. Um, and also, I think, you know, if you have, uh, if you have alternative routes out of the Caspian Basin, which this agreement also provides for with new corridors across, uh, you know, between Azerbaijan and, and Nakhichevan, um, it, it just gives Russia more control on these, these exit uh, routes for, uh, for resources, for goods services and, and the movement of, uh, of people. So uh, in terms of what you know, Russian uh, interests are, well, it's, it's to keep the South Caucasus in its orbit using uh, various, um, uh, various means, uh, kinetic and otherwise, uh, but it's also to prevent the emergence of a, of a real pluralistic democracy. And so obviously the people in the Kremlin right now are quite satisfied looking at the emergence of a one party state in Georgia. Ian, can I just, I mean, follow up? One of the questions uh, at posed is about assessing the de degree of, of uh, Russia infiltration. I assume this means in, in, in Georgia, political, economic, and security. My, I, could, I could stick in, what do you, what do you think assess of the degree of Russia infiltration of the United States as well? But, but for this conversation, let's focus on, on Georgia. Um, because I think that, you know, one of the challenges I know when you were ambassador, uh, part of the effort was to um, and had been for several years is to help Georgia uh, economically wean itself off of any dependence because Russia would cut off trade and use it as uh, as a tool, a uh, hybrid tool along with energy. Um, and I'm just, you know, as somebody you were there for, for three years and I'm, I'm just maybe your assessment or thinking about when you look at Georgia today, um, when you look at sort of economic security, political, do you, do you see a difference in terms of, of infiltration in Georgia that, that's different than when you saw maybe in, in 2015? Because uh, I think that's, that's, there was a few of these questions and I think this is attached to the one that I just asked about Russia's role 
Um, I think there is concern from some quarters about, you know, about growing economic in, uh, dependence or uh, how Russia infiltrates uh, different parts of Georgia or sectors. But I thought maybe, uh, you know, and David, feel, please feel free to jump in too, because I think it's, it requires, you know, uh, also thinking on the Western or sort of US and European side, how best to support those Georgians that want, don't want to have that dependence uh, move in the right direction. Yeah, I, I think one thing that I've, I've seen that's very concerning is the increasing use of, um, of far right groups, uh, anti, anti-Western groups, very you know, traditional uh, civil society or, or organizations that support traditional values. Uh, in many ways, uh, it is similar to what we uh, saw in, in 2020 in terms of supporting some of the far, the Russia supporting some of the far right voices uh, in uh, in the American uh, conversation, but I think we've seen it uh, increasingly in Georgia, and there the what the, the the kind of message they're trying to reinforce is kind of the siren song of neutrality. Um, they're I don't they're not trying to convince uh, Georgia necessarily to join the collective security treaty organization. Uh, or to have, uh, you know, increased political ties, diplomatic ties, whatever. It's more that the, the uh, message that if Georgians, if you want your country back, if you want to get full territorial integrity, you got to cut a deal with Russia. Uh, and so these are the kinds of groups, uh, media outlets, and political parties that are being uh, supported uh, by Russia. And uh, there have been some organizations um, um, that have uh, uncovered some documentation of that uh, that kind of uh, support, and that's outlined uh, in our report. Um, so I, I would just add, uh, Nita Evganidze's EPRC and the McCain Institute issued a report, I think it was uh, the last year or the year before, on Russian disinformation, which is a problem not unique to Georgia, obviously, um, but but is a problem in Georgia. And, and so there needs to be attention focused on that. Um, I, I think there's also been some concern about the Georgian government's um, lack of pushback on some of the Russian rhetoric and efforts that we've seen, including, and this is not, a, again, a problem unique that has happened under Georgian dream leadership, but the creeping annexation uh, by Russia into Georgian controlled territory. Um, of course, there was the incident in June 2019 with the Russian parliamentarian, Sergei Gavrilov, who uh, showed up invited by Georgian Dream in the Georgian parliament, spoke from the speaker's chair in Russian. That caused an, uh, an outburst of, of protest. Um, and let's also just boil it down quite simply. Putin doesn't want to see Georgia succeed. And what, it, what does that mean? He doesn't want it to become a vibrant democracy more deeply integrated into the Euro-Atlantic community. It's as simple as that. He wants to maintain Georgia under Russian control. Um, and I think we need to do a better job of explaining those differences. I've seen some of the questions asked, what could we offer uh, Georgia? And, and I've seen some points about FTAs and, and fair enough, uh, it, it may be a long uh, stretch to, to reach an FTA. It's hard to say what approach on trade agreements the current administration will take. and. It's possible negotiating one with Georgia could be easier than one might think, uh, but it would mean jumping ahead in the queue. I'm not an expert on trade agreements, but <clears throat> let's also keep in mind, Georgians, as, as we said, are the most pro-American country in the region. Um, it, it's not as if we have to persuade Georgians about the values and interests in integrating more deeply into the Euro-Atlantic community. They're already there. Um, what we need to do is to deliver. Um, and Georgians need to deliver. They need, it's a two-way street. The Georgians need to live up to their end of the bargain, but we also need to live up to our end of the bargain. And we, we say, keep the door open on NATO. We're, we're not um, uh, taking this lightly. It is a huge step, um, but we also can't let Russian occupation of Georgian 20, uh, territory, 20% of Georgian territory, uh, become a de facto veto over Georgia's aspirations. We need to get more serious 
about how we can move forward with Georgia's membership in NATO, because countries that become members of NATO become more secure countries. It's not to say there are never problems. Uh, there, there are some examples one could cite, but um, it would benefit both NATO and Georgia for sure. And Georgia's already demonstrated its readiness and ability to contribute to NATO operations even before becoming a member of NATO. You know, David, I think these are all good points. The, uh, there's a, a NATO meeting this week of foreign ministers, Secretary Blinken's there. Um, it looks like there'll be a NATO summit and likely in, in June. Uh, and what would be the advice to uh, Georgian leaders? Um, and, I, and I think, you know, I think there's heavier obstacles to overcome in Europe where there's skepticism. I think this type of crisis feeds into some skepticism. You know, what do Georgians need to do, uh, particularly on the, on the reform front? What are the, what are the leading issues that they need to really, obviously resolving the impasse we know is 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 the number one obstacle. But beyond that, it seems that there's some structural challenges, judicial, um, electoral, and otherwise that are also deeply connected to any type of FTA would need to have these types of issues resolved. But maybe just be asking both of you what you view as as the key to unlock, uh, you know, the, the reforms that, that are must have, um, and uh, you know, in order to to help move this process forward. Um, and, and, you know, is there anything uh, new or that, that, that we could be doing or others, partners of Georgia should be doing on the democracy front? One of those questions, one of the questions posed was, you know, what are you, you know, what else are you recommending? And, and, and the other part is, is this a situation where we're, you know, are there, you know, should, is it carrots and are there sticks too? Are there things that, that, you know, that, that might be? And I know others have brought up in some of the questions you know, what, what's the best strategy moving forward and what are the key reforms? So I don't know who, Ian, do you want to jump in or, or David? Okay, Ian, okay. Yeah, well, I think, you know, in this, this uh, early stage of this, uh, of this impasse or this uh, crisis, and uh, I do like to think it's still the early stage, uh, I think we should talk more in terms of incentives. Um, and I, you know, one of, you pointed out, Jonathan, one of the incentives, and I think uh, one of those incentives would be that June summit uh, and where we could talk about the, uh, the, the possibility of, the, of us being unable really to be forward leaning, maybe not forward leaning, but uh, how difficult it would be for us to, uh, to progress in, in NATO's relationship with Georgia in a situation where you've had uh, uh, a inability of the opposition and the and the government to to come to an agreement, so that's I, I think you know one one incentive that um, that we could do, but also you know as as David has said, it's also up to the Georgians to show to the the um, members of NATO that they are going to be a net provider of security rather than. Um, uh, as uh, one senator at the um, uh, Secretary of State's confirmation hearing said uh, that there would be war the day after Georgia became uh, part of NATO. So there are things that they that uh, Georgia can do uh, to uh, to reassure some of these reluctant uh, allies, uh, and that's that to uh, to provide more access to NATO, particularly on the Black Sea. I think, you know, the Black Sea in many ways is the connecting uh, tissue with, uh, with not only NATO, but, but uh, with Europe. Uh, and uh, they, could, they could offer to provide uh, NATO with, with better facilities than they have now in terms of a port, a deep sea port. Uh, they could offer to host a NATO center of, of uh, excellence. Uh, and then on the on the political side of it, uh, I think they need to not just look to Berlin and Washington. They need to look to some other uh, centers of support. And of course, that would be the Eastern European NATO members um, and and the Baltics, of course, and, and uh, not just the the three former Soviet states, but. Um, also, uh, uh, Norway and other countries that are much, uh, much better inclined to seeing Georgia 
as extending the uh, the, the borders of of security rather than inviting in uh, insecurity by uh, by accepting Georgia into NATO. David, do you want to jump into these questions? Yeah, I, I would just say on the on the concerns on democracy. Um, the the election was not perfect, and um, there are improvements that need to be made. Look, there there was a compromise reached a year ago between the opposition and Georgian Dream on the way forward with the elections. There was also supposed to have been release of all political prisoners, and Mr. Rurora still sits in prison to this day. He needs to be released as part of that year old agreement. Um, but there, there needs to be some electoral reform so that there is greater trust in the elections, again, with, with the proper humility coming from an American that we uh, offered in our author's note, given what we went through in our election here. Um, there needs to be more judicial reform. Um, Ian mentioned earlier about the use of the prosecutor's office and the courts to even political scores. That is not healthy for Georgia. There need to be more protection for journalists. Uh, protection for civil society so they can do their job, um, greater transparency. Um, and, and let me also just mention, I, I think, uh, sort of the elephant in the room, if you will. Um, there needs to be accountability. And, and by that, I mean, if you want to exercise influence and power in Georgia, you should hold an elected position or be appointed to a position uh, that requires uh, approval by the parliament. Um, having somebody behind the scenes pulling the strings um, is not a healthy way for Georgia to move forward. And I know Mr. Ivanashvili announced he was retiring from politics, what now, a month or two ago. Um, it seems pretty clear he is still the one pulling the strings behind the scenes. And uh, Georgia needs to move beyond this very personalized politics, uh, whether it's Saakashvili or Ivanashvili, um, it needs to have a more broad-based form of support for political platforms. Um, and and the, this use of power where once you get it, you want to make sure the opposition never returns to power. That, that is an unhealthy mentality. Again, not unique to Georgia, but if Georgia aspires to join Euro-Atlantic institutions, Georgia almost faces an added burden to prove itself. In many respects, it has, uh, particularly with the military contributions. Um, but on, when it comes to the democracy, there's more to be done, and and we can help. Uh, but Georgians have to follow, uh, have to have to pursue this path as well. Uh, we're we're getting. Thank you for that. We're getting close to the to our allotted time, and I, I did want to just come back to both of you for for final thoughts. And Ian, I, I want to come to you too because I think just maybe to maybe picking up on what. Uh, David said about uh, this issue of um, of leadership internally within Georgia and um, the roles that you guys have pointed out, where you know you you typically have one party dominance um, and so this pendulum swinging and fears of retribution. Um, again, I, I think it's a particularly important moment. I think you have a, an administration in Washington that's very supportive of Georgia and wants to see Georgia succeed on its Euro Atlantic track. But is also really, I think, in a way that we haven't seen, is really demanding, um, and 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 both internally of itself, as you guys are humbly uh, wrote about at the beginning of your report, where you were talking about the events of January six, but also also really pushing partners to um, deal with these domestic issues and move forward and strengthen their democracies uh, out of uh, sheer concern about security, prosperity. Uh, and Georgia is in the crossroads between in a, in a particularly tough neighborhood um, and it can't afford necessarily mistakes, but maybe you can pick up and maybe give some final thoughts and David, then we'll turn to you for, for the last word. Over to you, Ian. Yeah, in terms of final thought, yeah, Jonathan, you, you hit upon, I, I think a, a real kind of endemic uh, issue, we'll say in, in Georgian politics. And that's the idea of personalization of power where um, uh, people tend to identify the government in, in terms of one charismatic uh, leader. And I think that is, uh, it's very dangerous. Uh, it's very dangerous because it, it really stunts the development of, of leaders, uh, of, of new generations of leaders when you have these leaders who stay in politics 
for uh, for several generations sometimes. Uh, and this is just I. There was a it seemed to be a real opportunity uh, in uh, two thousand. Um, I'm going to get my date right here, 2017, when Prime Minister Kuti Kashvili really wanted to move uh, more power into parliament. Uh, and that, that was the real lost opportunity uh, for the development of uh, Georgian democracy and the development of, of democratic institutions. Uh, but I do think that uh, Georgia has to recognize how dangerous this, um, uh, this reliance on personalized power has been from Gamsa Hurdia through Shevardnadze and Saakashvili down to Ivanashvili. And uh, I will say that I think it would be a lot easier to resolve this crisis if both of those uh, figures, Ivanashvili and Saakashvili, who are not accountable to the voters, would um, withdraw. Uh, Ivanashvili has said he would withdraw, but I agree with David, he hasn't withdrawn. David, over, over to you, and then we're going to close our session. Sure. Well, Jonathan, first, let me just, um, again, thank you and GMF and Alina and everybody um, for, for hosting us, for um, being the, the sponsor of the report. Um, and um, I want to thank the, the viewers, too, who have asked great questions. A particular thanks to Mr. Gunther uh, Fellinger uh, for all of his questions and comments. I do really appreciate them. Very thoughtful. Um, and um, the, the, the point of this report was to bring attention to Georgia. We do it as um, uh, sort of neutral observers, but who care passionately about Georgia. Um, we're neither on the opposition side nor the government side. Um, we don't want to see the Georgian people suffer as a result of a political crisis that can and should be resolved so that Georgia can continue to move forward. Um, that's in Georgia's interest. It's in the United States' interest. And so we hope, whatever it takes, um, that this will get resolved immediately. Another day is a missed day of opportunity for Georgia. This has to get resolved. It's not healthy for the country and the Georgian people who are struggling with the pandemic as it is um, are, are going to pay the price if this doesn't get resolved quickly. So. Thanks again for, for doing this, really appreciate it. And, and we hope that we have generated um, some further uh, uh, ground for debate and discussion about Georgia. And I look forward to the hearing this afternoon in the Senate. Thank you. And, and uh, we urge everybody to, to, if you haven't had an opportunity to read through the report, please you know, definitely do that. Ian, David, thank you so much. On behalf of the German Marshall Fund, we were um, pleased to host both of you um, and I can, I can see even as we're closing, we have uh, more questions in the queue than we have time to deal with. So we'll try to go back and answer as many as we can. And, uh, uh, but I think it just hi highlights the, the interest uh, both in Georgia on both sides of the Atlantic, um, the desire to find a way uh, forward. Um, I think with this new administration, there's new opportunities for that type of engagement. Um, and, but, but a lot of this is up to the Georgians and Georgian leadership uh, right now to find a way forward, uh, but there are partners on, on in, in Brussels, in Washington, across the transatlantic space that want to want to see progress in Georgia and the Georgian people meet their goals. With that said, thank you to everybody. We will post this as well, the video. So if anybody came halfway through but wants to uh, to see more or wants to watch again because they want to hear uh, David and Ian uh, and, and, and if their you're thoughts. If you're insomniac. <laughs> Please do so. Otherwise, have a great rest of your morning. And if you're in Tbilisi, uh, your, your evening. And uh, we look forward to the next conversation on Georgia uh, and this region. Thank you and have a good rest of your day. Great. Thanks, Thanks very much. Thank you, Thank you all for it. joining us. Bye.